Nicholas Green graduated in law from the University of Leicester in 1980. He then completed a master's degree in Toronto, Canada and a PhD in Southampton. Nicholas was called to the bar at the Inner Temple in 1986 and he made his name in a landmark case, Facta Tame versus the Secretary of State for Transport. What better case could there be for a young barrister to make an impression than a direct confrontation between the government and the European Union? And to win the case against the government of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. In 1980, Spanish fishermen began to fish in British waters by registering their trawlers in the United Kingdom, taking advantage of a legal loophole. The government prohibited this by legislation that any trawler company seeking to register in the UK had to have 75% British ownership. When Spain joined the European Union in 1986, the stage was set for a conflict between EU law and UK law. Factor Tame Limited versus the Secretary of State for Transport was a judicial review case that uh, taken against the United Kingdom government by Factor Tame, a company of Spanish fishermen, who claimed that the Euro United Kingdom had breached European Union law by requiring ships to have a majority of British owners if they were registered in the UK. The case produced a number of significant judgments in British constitutional law and was the first time courts held that they had the power to restrain the application of an Act of Parliament when it was found to be contrary to EU law. Sir Nicholas joined the Factor Tame team of counsel in 1991 from Brick Court Chambers, and he acted in the case for 10 years. He represented Dutch and Irish companies that worked in consortia with Spanish company vessel owners called Factor Tame. Factor Tame, in fact, was the name of a particular fishing vessel which was decommissioned, but the name was kept because it was known in the courts and the public imagination. Sir Nicholas' involvement included it appearing as counsel in the High Court, the Court of Appeal, the House of Lords, the European Court of Justice. Sir Nicholas recalls, the case was great fun. I remember many meetings in chambers when the counsel team would sit around trying to work out what constitutional enormity we could topple next. Sir Nicholas' meteoric rise continued when he was appointed Queen's Council in 1998. He became UK permanent representative to the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe uh, between 2000 and 2002. Also in 2002, he was appointed Bencher, that is senior barrister of the Inner Temple, and made recorder in 2004. From 2009 to 2010, Sir Nicholas was elected chairman of the Bar Council, the professional body of all barristers in England and Wales, and in 2011, he became joint head of Brick Court Chambers. His appointment as judge of the High Court of Justice, Queen's Bench Division, followed in 2013, and he was made a Knight Bachelor in the same year. Sir Nicholas is the first law graduate of the University of Leicester to be appointed as a judge of the High Court of England and Wales. There can be no more than 108 High Court judges, and the appointments are made by Her Majesty the Queen on the recommendation of the Lord Chancellor and based on decades of distinguished work in the legal profession. Any university would be proud of an alumnus who becomes a High Court judge. However, we are especially gratified in Leicester that one of our own graduates, who is not from the privileged background of private education and Oxbridge, has achieved the highest accolade of the legal profession. Sir Nicholas is held in high regard by his judicial colleagues and has been assigned several high-profile cases, most recently a judicial review of the decision of the Secretary of State for Health to impose a contract on junior hospital doctors. Sir Nicholas has contributed to the life of the university in many ways. He has regularly participated in law school activities, giving lectures and talks to students and staff, as well as judging extracurricular court, court competitions. He has been an honorary professor since 2014, and in November 2016, he played a leading role 
in the Law School's Golden Jubilee celebrations, delivering a keynote lecture in honor of the founding professor of the Law School, Professor Jan Grodetsky. The lecture was called The Common Law After Brexit. Sinicola stressed the importance of students continuing to study EU law as it will be the basis of major changes in UK law. And, of course, this process will provide employment for lawyers for many years to come. In the Gilbert and Sullivan opera, Iolanthe, the Lord Chancellor describes the law as the embodiment of everything that is excellent. Sir Nicholas surely lives up to this aspiration as a result of his outstanding contribution to the legal profession and to society. He has brought credit to the university and embodies our aim of opening up pathways to achievement that have traditionally been dominated by entrenched patterns of privilege. Sir Nicholas is an inspiration to present generations of Leicester Law students as a person of the highest profession and distinction and public service who is living proof that there is no limit on what a Leicester graduate can achieve. Mr. President and Vice-Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and Council, I, pre I, I present Nicholas Nigel Green, that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Laws. Congratulations. Well done. Well done. Very impressive career. President, uh, Vice Chancellor, Lord Lieutenant, my Lord Mayor, fellow graduands, and very young members of the audience uh, who I hear are present today. Uh, I recall vividly sitting in this hall wearing my gown and mortar exactly as you do now, but waiting for my turn to ascend the platform. I remember walking up the stairs and that brief moment when the degree was handed over and I have photographic proof. Uh, my parents were in the audience, just as many of yours are today. Indeed, my mother is here today, uh, though sadly my father is not. Uh, he saw me sworn in as a High Court judge, but he did not make it to this ceremony. And so, so here I am again, 37 years later, on the same stage, and I have a feeling of imposter syndrome Listening to the oration, a, make, a mistake has surely been made. When a life is distilled into ten minutes of highlights and with the numerous lowlights diplomatically airbrushed out, the resulting image may be more flattering than the truth, but I nonetheless accept that portrayal with gratitude. It did, however, make me wonder what it was about my time at Leicester that gave me such a solid platform. I most certainly gained a rigorous education in the law from the faculty. The quality of the teaching staff was exceptionally high. The faculty was progressive. We had a wide array of academic options to choose from, which at the time was novel in law faculties across the country. When I came here in 1977, the United Kingdom had been in the European Union for just a few years we were amongst the very first students to learn European law, and I was intrigued by the subject. It mixed all sorts of different disciplines, ranging from international law through constitutional law to private law. It was exotically different to the much drier subjects that we were also studying, such as land law and equity. And it focused upon an issue that has fascinated me ever since, namely the relationship between the individual and the state. The faculty was also the first in the country to introduce it at a course in competition or antitrust law. We were taught about how the law interreacted with economics, and this included the regulation of cartels, monopolies, and mergers. And it was being introduced to these topics and these subjects that stimulated the interests that shaped the next 25 years and more of my career. But equally important, I grew up during my years in Leicester. I have to say that the students who attended the university in the late 1970s were a pretty cool generation. We were post the Beatles. 
This was the era of punk rock, but also electric light, light orchestra and the Rolling Stones. In this very hall, in 1978, I saw The Clash perform. They were one of the very first punk rock bands. They started a craze for pogo dancing. When you jumped up and down and you crashed horizontally into the person next to you. The greater the volume of beer consumed, the more violent and dangerous the dancing. Many students then sported brightly coloured spiky hair. Pink and green were very popular. Huge safety pins were inserted through noses, ears, lips and other body parts. I suspect that, uh, certainly amongst the parents, there are quite a few ex-punks in the audience. Yes, I see a few nodding. I'm tempted to ask for a show of hands. Punk rock, I have to confess, was not quite my style. My wife, whom I met on my very first day as an undergraduate, would fall about laughing if I ever claimed to have been cool. Uh, I was much more uh, ELO and Mr Blue Sky although I did think punk rock actually was rather loud and dangerous. I did see David Bowie live when he was in his Ziggy Stardust phase. I learned many valuable lessons, valuable life skills during my time here. Leicester then was a magnet for immigration from the subcontinent and there were some fantastic Indian restaurants. One was on Highfield Road, just off the London Road, where after a few pints in the Marquis of Wellington, still here, but it's a bit more upmarket these days, that we would go for a curry. It was there that I learned how to eat ridiculously hot vindaloos. Curry eating competitions were very popular, particularly amongst the rugby teams. The campus has in fact changed little since then. Certainly a few new buildings have been squeezed in, but the basic layout remains the same. It still feels immediately familiar. For two years, I lived in a house on Salisbury Road, literally 50 metres, 60 metres away from here. There were seven young men in this house. We kept the kitchen just as clean as you no doubt kept yours. <laughs> the houses are still there. They look no different, though now they're occupied as faculty offices. The law faculty in the late 1970s was very small by modern standards. There were 100 students per year, 300 students across the entire faculty, and only 3,000 or 4,000 across the entire university. But the faculty, even now, does not feel different. I'm sure that the books in the Harry Peach Library have not changed at all since the days when I used to sit there and attempt to write essays. Longhand, there were no laptops in those days. Many of my fellow students uh, went on to achieve considerable success, just as no doubt you will. One became a minister in the last coalition government, and he is still an MP. Another became the chief constable of the Metropolitan Police in London, the most senior policing position in the country. Another is one of the most talented and senior criminal judges in the country, and another is now a leading Queen's Counsel practicing in commercial law. The fact that I enjoyed my time in the faculty so much meant that I was reluctant when I graduated to embark on any sort of real work. So I applied to do a master's degree in Canada and I was offered a place and a scholarship at the University of Toronto. When I headed off, these were the days before mobile phones and computers, we used to communicate with home by letter or good old fashioned landline. In Canada, I took courses in Canadian company law intellectual property and constitutional law. I wrote a thesis on comparative competition law. More importantly, much more importantly, I spent time travelling around Canada and took advantage of the close proximity of New York to Toronto. I was in New York with fellow master students on the 8th of December 1980 when John Lennon of the Beatles was shot. We were staying in a hostel just a couple of blocks away. When I returned to the UK and to my first academic post in Southampton in 1981, I was only a year or so older than the students I was expected to teach. 
when in Canada, I received a letter from the dean at Southampton telling me in broad terms what it was that I was expected to educate the students in, contract taught European law. When I arrived in Southampton, the dean, a very distinguished professor, said, Nick, I forgot to tell you that you're going to teach company law and partnership starting on Monday. I replied, but I've never studied company law as an undergraduate. He said, never mind, just swat it up. Keep a week ahead of the students. <laughs> that is what I did. I rapidly began to learn the art of advocacy, which is how to trick an audience into thinking you actually know more than you do. <laughs> Something I spent the next two, two decades doing to judges. This was an essential skill for a young academic. When a student asked me a question that I could not answer, I learned to say, that's a very good question, but you really should know the answer. Research it and tell me it next week. <laughs> Less successful as an answer was the following. Good question, does anyone else want to uh, propose an answer? This was not such good approach because if someone else did suggest an answer, I was then expected to know whether it was right or wrong. In 1985, I left academia for the bar, and I was called to the bar in 86, and then I embarked upon 20 years of practice, some of which the orator has mentioned. Throughout that period, my grind, uh, grounding in legal principles received in the faculty here never left me. And then four years ago, I was appointed to the High Court bench. There are just over 100 High Court judges. We're a close and collegiate group. We are in the same building as the Court of Appeal, which is another 30-odd judges, and we form a strong uh, collective. We all have chambers or offices in the Royal Courts of Justice on the Strand in London. The Royal Courts of Justice is it's a bit like Harry Potter's Hogwarts. It's over 150 years old and from appearances has not been modernised since. On the non-public side of the building, there are nearly three miles of corridors and nearly 1,000 rooms. The main courts are extraordinary Victorian panelled rooms with vast vaulting ceilings. My work, though, still reflects many of the interests that I first developed at Leicester. I do quite a lot of judicial review involving questions of economic regulation or constitutional international and EU law. Though part of my time is spent trying generally high-profile criminal cases, usually murders, but sometimes cases with a political element in them. In my own mind, there is a very real continuity between the time I spent here over 30 years ago and what I do now. According to tradition, in drawing a response to an end, I'm supposed to offer words of wisdom to you who are graduating and embarking upon the world of work into the profession, public service, academic world, or private sector. And I should start with something classical and portentous. I should perhaps say carpe diem. This was the advice set out in 23 BC by the Roman poet Horace, who in his work, The Odes, coined that phrase. Translated, it means seize the day. When so-called wise people say this to you, we're meant to be encouraging you to leave here, to leave this ceremony, and immediately turn to consider your futures. We're meant to inspire you to take hold of your achievement in graduating and immediately use it as a platform or a stepping stone to go on to great things. In other words, don't hang about. Actually, I think my generation should show some self-awareness in the advice that we give. Political events of recent times do not show us to be as wise as we would care to believe. We do not always remember that the future is yours, not ours. In fact, the full line in Horace's poem, translated, says, seize the day, put very little trust in tomorrow. So my advice to you is a little bit different. I'd like you to consider putting off or deferring the seizing of the day maybe until the week after next, or even until the end of the summer. In the meantime, have a few drinks, get down to a bit of serious hedonism, enjoy the weather, chill out on the beach or in the park. There will be plenty of time for some serious carpe dieming later on. <laughs> but you have worked incredibly hard, and frankly, you deserve some time off. 
And when you do come finally to consider seizing the day, do remember that as a graduate of this wonderful university, the world out there truly is yours to seize. So good luck and thank you.